Stand, turn to page 454, down to the cross. because you are worthy to be worshipped. And Lord, let every heart just be open to that praise, that this is the reason we're here today, because our precious Savior, Jesus Christ, died for our sin, took the punishment for our sins, and now, Lord, we lift him up. We lift him up in our hearts because we know today that we've not come for any other celebration but one thing, that we have a Savior who loves us so much, He died for us. Now, Father, today we pray that the Spirit of God, the Comforter, would be in every heart, and we pray, Lord, that that Comforter would be in every person's way, that they would realize they need. They need direction, and we need direction, and we need it in every manner. Lord, with the world in such chaos and the things that's come against your sweet nation of Israel. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray, Lord, for the people of Israel. We pray, Lord, that you, through these battles and through these things, would open up the hearts and minds of those who don't believe. And Father, let our church be much in prayer for Israel today. And in our hearts and private prayers, let us lift that place up because we know that you have said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now today, Lord, I pray you'll empty me. Empty me of me and fill me with thy Holy Spirit, that the things that I preach will be according to your will and according to your way. And this, Lord, I pray through Christ Jesus, that everything that we do in the baptism of these two candidates today, Lord, that they'll live their entire life serving you. Let it be a holy time today in the reference to you and in every manner. Let us bow humbly before you and ask to be merciful unto us, the sinner, 
for you have and you are. And we pray it through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the yeah. Lord today? Amen. Now, don't mistake me. I'm not Pope. I'm not a Pope today. But uh, Joanna was looking me up and down. She, she, if she sees me with a cane, she says, you don't need that. She seen me with Jim Walker yesterday, and she said, you don't need that. <laughs> so today she was checking me out, and she said, what's that for? <laughs> I love her. She's, she keeps... Listen, she pays attention to her preacher. That's just plain and simple. But it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. May God bless you richly for being here today. And in the prayer, I do mean it. We need to be much in prayer for the peace of Jerusalem and the things that are taking place. Pray for those that's been taken hostage. Pray that God is going to make sure, that, without a doubt, that the sacrifices that's made there will bring people to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And let's pray that that is going to be an occurrence that we know is going to take place. Just a few announcements and we'll go on with our service. Uh, October 11th, we continue in our Bible study of Psalm 119. Psalm 119, again, is, is something that I believe that if you listen to it very carefully you would find that it has every eight verses a new beginning. It goes through the Hebrew alphabet. It's the longest psalm in the Bible. It's actually longer than a lot of the book of Esther. It's longer than uh, the book of Joshua. It's, it has 179 verses. And you have to see that each one of them has a great meaning. We began every single time. And it applies to your life. So I hope and pray that you, if you haven't, will take time to join us in our Bible study on Wednesday night. And I hope and pray that you do. Next Sunday, uh, Pastor Appreciation Sunday, cover dish following. And I hope everybody that's here come and invite somebody else. I, I just... Uh, want to say to you, I don't know, just like you don't know, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, but I just want to live just like it's the last one. I, I baptize these two candidates today like it's my last one. Why? Because I have cancer? No, because we should live like this is our last day and we're about to meet our maker. When we begin to live like that, we'll worship differently. We'll come into this house and we'll be grateful that we're here. Happy we've made it another week. And I hope and pray that that's the attitude you'll begin because I know without a doubt it will be a good time and a good change of your attitudes just like I need it to. Fall Festival, that's going to be on a Sunday evening beginning at 5 o'clock. And I hope and pray that you'll... Uh, be a part of that. If the kids, I know, really, really love it. Fellowship meal at 6. It's probably going to be hamburgers, hot dogs, bow. Is that what it is? Yeah. Hamburgers, hot dogs, trimmings, and such. So come, bring somebody. I know you'll love it. And uh, let me say this. It's going to be a whole lot safer for you to come to church for their fall festival than to celebrate Halloween in a dangerous places like we're living in today. There's people just don't care about whether they hurt a child or not. So we need to be very, very careful. And we need to be much in prayer that a lot of children won't have that protection and we need to pray for their protection. And I hope you will. All right, we're doing a uh, Baptist children's home. We're, uh, we're taking up an offering for that it's, uh, it's not a special offering. You'll see the envelopes in front of you in the pews. If you want to make a contribution, an offering to the Baptist Children's Home, uh, we're going to be doing that through October. And Cindy, is that going to go any further in October? Um, most times we do uh, November 2, so it uh, gives people more time to uh, donate to the fund. I don't know if you've ever been to one of the Baptist children's homes, 
But if you ever go, you would see that it's not a waste of money. You're really putting your money into something that gives these children that doesn't have a home, a home. And the character that they build and the love of God and the worship and all the things that's provided. And it's a safe environment. You, you've not heard, I didn't say that it couldn't happen, but you've not heard anything where any of the children have been violated in any manner at any of these homes. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't say that it couldn't happen, but I just want to tell you that if you ever visit them, you'll find out these are good, godly people that are running those homes, and they love. I know uh, Heather has, has gone there, and I know that if she could tell you in a moment that it's well worth your investment for the Baptist Children's Home, because you know what you're investing in? You're investing in the children who are seated in the Word of God, just like it's a church. And I hope and pray that you'll make in your heart room for an offering for the Baptist Children Home. Okay, any other announcements I may have missed? Yeah, I'm just going to add, reason we're doing October, November, because we didn't start in September, but also in your uh, bulletins is an insert about the Baptist Children's Home. Okay. All right. Okay, if you take your hymnals, and stand and turn to page 337, The Solid Rock.
seated. And we've been blessed with two specials today. Uh, the first is going to be Crystal and Eleanor, and then we'll have Jennifer and Jonathan.
Everybody's got a blank page A story they're writing today A wall that they're climbing You can carry the past on your shoulders Or you can start over regret No matter what you've gone through, Jesus He gave it all to save you He carried the cross on his shoulders So you can start over You know, I put Eleanor on the spot. I said, Eleanor, when are you going to sing for me? And she said, I don't know. I said, well, ask your mama. Well, I'm going to ask Aunt Crystal. I said, that'll be a good idea. <laughs> so I was really happy this morning because I had asked Eleanor for doing that. And I don't know if you realize it, but our young people are an illustration of who we really are. But sometimes I believe they outshine us. I think they have more and not afraid to ask, what does this mean? What's that for? And they are not bashful to learn about God. We have a lot of grown-ups that just won't do that. They're afraid to ask, what does this mean? And that's what you should be doing. You need to be growing in the Lord. When you leave here, you have some answered questions that comes from God. 
And so it's just a wonderful thing that I think that we need to learn from our young people today because they're not afraid to ask questions. And I thank God for that. And, and I don't mind sharing this with you. Uh, a lot of the series that I've been preaching on is sin. And it's because they had started asking questions about where the devil come from, where did sin come from, where is, what is this for? And, and a lot of people, if you ask, I got news for you, there's a lot of pastors don't know the answer to these questions. So therefore, it's important that we realize what it's all about. I, I'll share something with you that sort of like on Wednesday night. There's not a person out here that doesn't have a conscience. But where did conscience come from? And you're going to get all kinds of answers. Well, Adam and Eve were innocent. They didn't have a conscience. But when God told them not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that fruit gave them a conscience. And we inherited that conscience with our sin nature. God didn't intend you to have a conscience. He intended you to trust Him. And the problem we got today is we have lived now with our conscience that bothers us. But you have to realize that God wants you to understand that there was no conscience in creation. So it's important that just like these studies and you share that and you give that these are little golden nuggets that you need to put in your heart and remember and and sometimes just sit back and meditate all right that's enough joshua chapter seven joshua chapter seven title of the message is sin the defeat of faith everybody knows who charlie brown is the cartoon character and Charlie Brown, he was in deep, with a deep statement, and here's what Charlie says, and sometimes it is good what it's put there. He says, we have spotted the enemy, and he is us. You see, we're our enemy. We have a character that's inside of us, an old nature, that you, if, if you had a picture of him, you'd say, I don't recognize him. I recognize the things that he does inside of me and the temptations that he, he constantly wants me to have. You see, it's not always the devil and it's not always the demonic. That nature that's inside of you, you don't recognize it as an enemy. You don't recognize the character of your sinful nature. You can have a lot of pictures of things and you're reminded this is so-and-so and so-and-so. And but the enemy is within us and we don't know what it looks like. I think if I was to describe what my sin nature was like, I would have to go all the way to Calvary when Jesus was beaten and Jesus was bloody and Jesus was hanging on that cross and I said, that's my sin nature. That's what sin caused. Because the sin debt that was given. It's difficult to recognize your own sin nature. It's a very graphic picture, a portrayal of what sin does to anyone. Because sin is a destroyer. I don't care what you do. I don't care how you think it's such a small task. Sin is a destroyer. It may not be immediate, but I can assure you that sin will eventually destroy what you have in store. Sin, now let me say this to you, we're fixing to celebrate what, we, what I hate, which is Halloween, and we're going to see pictures of what we call the devil and it's going to be a red suit with a fork and tail and a pitchfork and we say, that's the devil. I'm going to tell you again, the reason I mention that is 
that God created Lucifer and he was the anointed cherub and he is so absolutely beautiful that he's breathtaking. He is not the ugly thing that the Greeks call the great God Pan of vegetation and pleasure. Now, why do I tell you that? God created Lucifer absolutely beautiful. And so is sin. Sin is attractive. If it looked horrible, you'd never commit it. Sin is so beautiful and attractive that you're lured to it. Something that is beautiful you just seem to fasten your eyes to and you can't seem to take your eyes off of it. And that's exactly when you see that, you're seeing the devil. <clears throat> and he's not ugly. He is attractive. You're drawn to him. How? By the enemy that's within you. The enemy, your own sin nature. See, it's the enemy within that destroys. You remember the city of Troy? and For ten solid years they tried to defeat the city of Troy, but they couldn't. So they made the Trojan horse. Everybody remember that? Say amen. <laughs> and what happened? They, they said it's a gift. And, and they waited until their armies uh, withdrew and, and they pulled that horse inside. And the enemy was within the horse. And it was defeated from within. The church cannot be defeated from the outside. It has to be defeated from the inside. And it's usually brought in by Christians. It's usually brought in because they have allowed the world into their lives and they're bringing that worldly thing into the church and eventually it begins to destroy the church. I have cancer inside of me. It will destroy me. Not on the outside. If it was on the outside, I'd ask you to help take it off of me. But the fact of the matter, our enemy is within us. And the enemy that is within us and we can't recognize, it is like looking through something and you say, I don't recognize who that is, but you recognize the results that he led you to a beautiful thing. And that beautiful thing is sin. You know, the weakest is we, we care more about whether we violate someone's rights today than we care about whether or not we've offended God. As a nation, we are beginning to go downward. We're spiraling out of control because of the things that we're allowing is within. I know some of you are probably not old enough to remember a Russian leader by the name of Khrushchev. Khrushchev said and made this statement and he was factual with it. He said we could never defeat the United States but one day we will defeat them from within without ever shedding one drop of blood. Because the weakness is the arrogance of the American people that are going to get their way and they're going to do whatever they please. Today, we're making laws that are offensive to God, but yet we pray for God's blessings. We put in God we trust on our money, but yet we trust Him not. We have all these things that we have within us that are an offense and a weakness to ourselves. And we don't recognize it. We don't meditate on those things. People on drugs, overdose, how? 
very simply because the enemy on the inside sways them to take one more pill or one more injection. The alcoholic, uh, he becomes a drunk driver and, and he kills people and kills himself. How? Because he tells himself that he can drive under that influence. He's all right. Uh, we begin to see all of these enemies that's within us. Alexander the Great, he conquered the world. He was 35 years old when he conquered the world. But yet, he could not conquer himself. He was an alcoholic. And he finally committed suicide. In this story today, we see the children of Israel have marched unhindered. They have won every battle that God had given them. So let's begin reading here the, verse, the first seven verses of Joshua chapter 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth -Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoken to them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither other people, about, five, about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Sherebah, <coughs> and smote them in the going down whereof the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening tide, and he and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their head. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, Wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. May God add his blessing and understanding to the reading of his holy word. Listen very carefully. Ai was nothing. Just like with you in your own life, you will be praying for something that is big. But you think that you can handle the little things. And the little things that you did not pray about becomes the big things. And the big things become little things because you fail to pray for all things. We're all guilty because we're overconfident in a lot of things that we pursue. So the first thing I want you to see how this nation got into trouble. First, there's the peril in victory. Now, why would I say that? Well, I'm going to try to sort of cut the sermon a little bit shorter to the point, not to you miss nothing, but to give you an understanding here. What is the peril of victory? You must realize that they had marched around Jericho. And Jericho was just impenetrable. Do you know how thick their walls were? They were 150 feet thick. They were not going to fall down. They are not going to fall down. They're just not going to. God told them what to do and they did it. And the walls, what did we learn as, as a kid? And the walls came tumbling down. Now God said something. God said do not take anything that is in Jericho. It belongs to me. Now, you might be asking why. Well, when God told them to leave everything in there that it belonged to Him, it was because this was the first fruits before they entered 
the promised land. When I get my paycheck, whenever I get my money, the first thing I take out of it is what belongs to God. Why? Because that's the first fruits of my labor. God gets it first before I even attempt to pay any kind of bill. Whether I can meet my bills or not, that belongs to God. God is saying to you, nation of Israel, this belongs to me. All of the spoils of Jericho belong to me. But a man named Achan, when the walls fell down and they plundered the city, gathering all the values to give to God, Achan, he takes 50 pounds of gold. He takes a ton, I don't know how much silver. But then he did something else. He took some Babylonian garments. Now you might be saying, ah, why is that in the Bible? Why is, it, why is that in there that he took garments? What, what was so special? Well, now, if I, if I ask this, I'm going to probably say this wrong, ladies, so y'all can giggle. You got a pocketbook and it's Liz Claiborne. Is that expensive? Well, I'll tell you what, you go to Walmart and buy a pocketbook. And you carry it to a society. And they say, where'd you get this? And you say, well, I got it at the family dollar or the dollar tree. Well, they're, they're just not impressed at all. But they say, where have you got this? And, oh, it's a Liz Claiborne. Or, I wish I did my research. <laughs> Somebody give me a good name. Michael Kors. What? Michael Kors. Had to be two words. I said one. <laughs> well, she got a pocketbook and it's Michael Kors. They said, wow, where did you get that? Oh, I got it when I was in New York. Well, now I did that for a reason. You see, the Babylonian garments, when somebody would go to Babylon, they'd say, did you get any garments with? Oh, yeah, let me show them to you. They were the end dress. Everybody got that? Say amen. See, God put it in there. I'm trying to tell you why it's in there. Say amen. amen. I got it in Babylon. Well, old Aiken seen that and he said, I got to have them. And so he got all that and hid it under his tent. Well, the perils that we have in victory is we begin to celebrate. Oh, we begin to celebrate. And, and we're so happy that we have achieved everything just like David. David was supposed to be where? On the battlefield. But David, he was in the, in the palace. We begin to see places that we should be, but we're not there. And so when we begin to see what Achan did, God called it the accursed thing. So, Joshua, he says, I'm not going up here to Ai and see what we need to do to take Ai. I mean, they come back and said, oh, they... No problem, we can do it with 3,000 men. Now let me ask this question. Did he pray when he was going to take Jericho? And the answer is yes. Yes. He took all the instructions that God gave him and he obeyed. But now AI, I'm not going to spend no time on AI. I've got it whipped. If we can beat Jericho, that little old measly town up there, we'll destroy it just like that. How about going up there and see what we need? He said, I'll take about 3,000 men up there. Y'all go ahead and party, celebrate the victory of Jericho, and we'll just go up there and take that little old place like it's not. Amen. 
Ai come out, killed 36 men, and put the rest of the men in fear. Now, when they went up there, they had faith. They had faith that they were going to just take it. But they had faith without prayer. Faith without prayer is a guaranteed defeat. We might have faith in a whole lot of things, but if we have faith and we have no prayer with our faith, we're guaranteed to be not victorious, but defeated. Joshua blamed God. And he fell on his face, tore his garments, and rent his garments, and got on his face and prayed and said, God, what have you done? Why have you brought us over here? Have you brought us over here for the Marites, for them to destroy us? Is that you? Why did you bring us over here to begin with? Why didn't we just stay on the other side? And God said, shut up and get up and stop praying. There's sin in the camp. So God told him what to do and he went through all the process. And when he gets to Achan, Achan confessed. You know what God told him to do? Stone him, his family, his cattle, his house, and every single thing that he had and then burned them. You say, isn't that a little excessive? Not at all. When God destroys sin, He destroys. But what we do, how do we learn from this? I can tell you how. You just had a great victory in something. The devil's been tempting you and you beat him. Well, this other thing's not that big a deal. <laughs> and you go to defeat him without prayer. Now you had faith in the big thing. You had faith in the little thing. In one you had prayer, in the other you had no prayer. And by doing so, you guaranteed yourself to be defeated. How many times are you going to be praying for somebody and you basically are not praying with faith, you're praying with fear. And fear is the teetotal destroyer of faith. You see, if you have fear, that's why God would uh, come and say, fear not. Why? Because He knows that if you're afraid, you have no faith in Him. You should have faith. Now, some people call that confidence. There's a big difference. Confidence comes from the flesh and faith comes from the Spirit. We got a lot of people that have confidence. And my friend, I got news for you about that. Confidence comes from the flesh. And anytime you're dealing in the flesh, that nature that's inside of you is smiling all the way to be the one that defeats you. Why? <coughs> Just as fear destroys faith, so does confidence destroys faith. It's mistaken for faith. You cannot see your confidence. You can only know it. We must realize that what took place here was no prayer. God set the standards and God said it all belonged to Him. And so many people today, they don't tithe. Oh, preacher's talking about money. Yeah, the preacher's talking about God's money. Something that don't belong to you. 
something that God gave you to do, and God gave you the strength to do it, and God gave you all these things, but yet you're not willing to give back God's portion. You see, it's almost like being in a partnership with God and you reneging on your partnership. God says, what does that? Well, that character that's inside of you tells this. Now listen, there ain't no greater statement. God understands that I need it more than He does. No, you need it more than God does. In what manner? Obedience. You see, it's not about the money. And then when we get into tithing, what is God also telling us? What does God ask for? Is God just asking for money? God gave you the strength and everything to do that. But what's the second thing? What's the other thing? My time. If I gave 10% of my time, how many hours in a week? 168. Do I give 16.8 hours of my life to the Lord? That's tithing God's time back to it. God gave me the time. God gave me the 168 hours. Do I give Him back? I'll just round it off. 17 hours a week. Do you give God 17 hours a week? You see, it's not just money. God wants your time. God wants you to tithe to Him the things that was taking place. Now Joshua was taking care of the time. But the rest of it, Achan was stealing from God. The second thing of that is I, I don't mind telling you defeat comes when we underestimate our enemy and, and overconfident in ourselves. So the second thing is we need to pray for victory. And praying for victory is something that you and I really need to to come to with just natural things of saying, you know what? I don't have to think twice. Do you know one of the things that bothers me more than anything else? I'll say, Lisa, I'm going to pray for Maddie. She said, well, thank you, preacher. I said, no, I'm going to pray now. You know why? I'm not going to load my wagon down because I'm going to forget somebody. But if I pray right then and there, it's not for me to get the task over with. It's for me to keep my word that God has given me to give to us. What am I going to do? I'm going to pray when God tells me that. Now what time is that? There again. Where are you with your prayer time? That's that 17 hours I'm talking about. Do you give God 17 hours of, of your study in His word? Do you give God 17 hours of a prayer that's mixed in that 17 hours. Tell me something. Look and see in that 17 hours of time that you put into the Lord. You see, we talk about victory and we think about all the things that we've achieved. But what have we achieved? When we have turned away from God. We've not met the standard of obedience of God. Third thing was the covetousness. Joshua 7, 2. It says Achan was the son of Carmine. That means that his uh, Carmine means fruitful and noble. He was the grandson of Zabdi. That means God is a giver. He was the great grandson of Zerah. That means a sprout of new life. So you see the family tree in generation after generation was good. But what did Achan mean? Achan meant trouble. Now I don't know anybody that would name their child trouble. But trouble he was. Trouble. The Bible says he took 200 shekels of silver and 50 pound wedge of gold it also says he took some Babylonian garments that I mentioned. 
And I used to think, now why in the world would he take those suit of clothes? It's sort of like what's happening with Air Jordans today. People are killing someone for a pair of shoes. I mean, you may think that's ridiculous, but I'm telling you without a doubt. People are killing other people for things like that. You know, if you look at advertisement today, I read the other day that on the average of one hour you see 16 advertisements in one hour. I think that's, that's miscalculated. I mean, I, I'll tell you, if you go to try to watch something on television, uh, if you don't tape it, two breaks and there's 16 advertisements. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Why? Well, they know that if they can let you see it, you're going to want it. Not necessarily all the time, but a lot of things will. But third thing is simple disobedience. What happens that leads to the potential of one man's sin can do to many others? Well, old Aiken, you may be thinking, well, God was pretty harsh. If one of those people that died was one of your relatives, do you think that he was being excessively bad toward Achan in punishment? No. 36 men died because of Achan's sin. You know, a preacher was talking and I was listening and he said he was talking about a 10-year-old boy in another city and it breaks my heart when I hear these things and I, I even, uh, it hangs on me. I, I, I wish it didn't, but it hangs on me. But a 10-year-old boy being bullied at school took lawnmower gas and poured over himself and set himself on fire and he died. They were trying to figure out why. Well, his mom and dad divorced. Then he was given to one grandparent, then to another grandparent, then to an aunt, then to another aunt, until finally ended up in foster care. He didn't know what love was. And that broke my heart. Still breaking my heart. I, I can't get him off of my mind. It's, it just breaks my heart. Why? Because nobody wanted him. Somewhere down the line, somebody dropped the, the ball. You know, when you sin, you say, well, it's just me. If I get into trouble, it's just me. But that's not true. I saw pastors who have sinned, and, and they, they've affected their family, they've affected their churches. I told Jim one time, I said, you know, I have to be better than I am. Because if I see it, Joe and I would be over here to put it on the news and the church would be condemned, then the members would be looked on by other members of other churches. So if you don't think that the pastor has a responsibility to so many, you might start getting the fact of ache and sin. It affected the nation. It affected all of God's people. It affected his family. It affected everybody. And the same thing occurs if people know you're a Christian and you do something, you know what happens? It's just blown up. And people will look, well, look where they go to church. It used to be, well, they don't go to church. Now, if they go to church, well, look where they go to church. You've got to see that it affects everybody and it will continue to affect people. And, and if we could leave the story right there, that would be tragic. But you've got to realize that you can leave it right there because every sin that we commit affects more than just you. It affects the whole family. It affects the things that God has confidence in you about. And you, you've used that and distrust in the Lord. 
You know, we've seen the, the sin we've committed as God sees our sin. I, I, and I want to mention this, and, and I'll get short with this. I talked to a man, and I'll never tell you anybody's name, but the man said, I have to confess my sin. I said, well, confess it to God, not to me. He said, but I need to confess it to you, Pastor. Now, he's not a member of this church. And I'll not even hint the denomination. He said, I'm guilty of incest. I said, you, you've committed incest? He said, in my mind and in my heart, but I'm not physically done it, but I have in my mind and my heart. Do I need to ask God to forgive me of that? I said, that's not even a question. I said, you should verbally get alone with God and just say, God, I'm guilty of incest. And God will forgive you. You see, Proverbs says that a man who covers up his sin will not prosper. So you have to realize that we have people that are confessing their sins, but what does that mean? What is it talking about here? Well, he's talking about making sure that you and I confess our sins to the Lord, and confessing our sins to the Lord means very simply that this person, he didn't want to uh, physically commit incest. He, he wanted this off of him, and he said, I don't even know why it's in me. I said, because the old nature in you has put it in you by the things you watch, the things that you read, and the things that you've allowed inside of you, and each took it and blowed it up, and the thing about it is you need to get away from your old nature and get closer to God. He openly said, God, I'm guilty of incest. Please forgive me. You know what he's saying? He said, wow. I feel like it's gone. I feel like it left me. I said, God makes no difference what other people may think or say. God is between you and God and God is taking care of that for you because you confessed it and you meant it. You know, when you sin, you say, well, it's just me. I get into trouble. It's just me. But that's not true. You, you have to see everything that was taking place. God struck <laughs> Eli's two sons dead because they were disobedient. God told them to go get the fire off of the, the holy altar and bring it in to burn incense. Well, they said, oh, I'm not going to walk all the way down there. We'll just get any kind of fire. So they struck up a fire of their own, brought it in. Who's going to know the difference? Fire burns. You can't tell the difference in a holy fire and an unholy fire. But God did. And God struck them dead. There's a lot of things that people don't realize what obedience means to the Lord. Obedience that you and I should realize we need to do. You remember when the early New Testament church got started and Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they wanted to do all these things, brought an offering to the Lord. And, and it was all right to bring the offering, but they pretended that it was something else. It was greater than what they were giving. So a lot of times we, in our own way, why did that happen with Ananias and Sapphira? Because of the inter sinful nature that persuades us to do so many things that offends God. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. God will forgive you. I had a woman to ask me to pray for her son. And I said, okay. So I started praying. I said, Lord, I pray that he comes to know Jesus Christ as his Lord. 
When I got done, she said, uh, Pastor, I needed you to pray for his sickness. And I said, well, I will when he comes to know the Lord. Well, that's not right. I thought pastors prayed for people. Can I pray that God will heal him so he can keep on being who he's been? Can I say it's okay to pray for this man to get well so he can keep sinning against God? She stormed off and he spoke to me saying, I got news for you. You're doing the same thing. You're praying for people that need to first repent because do you think God's going to bless somebody so they can continue to lead others in sin? No. Well, we got to get our perspectives right because you see there the sin nature in us, that old nature that you can't see is inspiring you. Oh, you must pray for their wellness. You must pray for them to get better. You know, they'll probably come to know the Lord if you'll pray they get better. I got news for you. Sometimes God gives sickness, not always, that you might get a better relationship with Him. We don't trust that. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us. You see, you know, it, it's... Lord, you're right. It's sin. Whoever you are, when you're alone, when you're alone, when you're away from everybody, you're all by yourself, and you've got your own thoughts, and nobody's around. That's how God sees you. Get it any heart. Whoever you are when you're alone, if you want to know how God sees you, because when you're alone in your own thoughts, that's how God sees who you are. He sees your heart because you know what? There ain't nobody around to see what your thoughts are. And you've got all your thoughts going. And God, you keep saying, I wonder how God sees me. God sees me and you when we are alone in our thoughts. That's how God sees you and me. So when you begin to think, that you've got a church that thinks their pastor is walking on water. That's a joke. It's not how you see me. It's how God sees me when I'm alone in my thoughts. That's how God sees who I am. So who are we? And what are we? You know, Gerald Ford went to lunch one day after Sunday service and then had communion that day. And he was convicted in his heart and mind. He said, I don't care what I do the rest of the day. When I get back, I'm going straight to the White House and I must pardon President Nixon. I must pardon him. I cannot prolong the bad dreams of a nation any longer. I offer him a pardon full and free. Now immediately there was a storm of protest. They said, well that isn't fair. He didn't even ask forgiveness. Why should the president give him a pardon? Well there were a lot of theological questions that came. Can you forgive somebody that doesn't repent? The point is this. When we sin there are broken relationships. The president broke it with a nation. Achan broke it with a nation and with God. You say, I've committed some secret sin. So I come before the church and say, here's what I did. No. President Nixon 
made his restitution when he said, I'm sorry. Nobody seemed to have heard him say, I'm sorry. Except Gerald Ford. All those who did and said he's not asked for forgiveness. Do you know sometimes what my prayer is to God? You want to know, say amen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. I messed up. I'm sorry. Be merciful unto me, the sinner, for I am. We're living in a time where it's so easy to think that what you do doesn't affect anybody else. But I'm here to tell you today that it does. If you have the confidence in your own self to believe that what you do is okay, and you could care less what other people think, then add this to that particular statement. Do you care what your sin does to other people? And above all, to your Lord. Do you care? Do you say you love God and yet you just freely, freely turn your back on Him? Again, I want to say this, and I promise you I'm closing. Who you are, alone in your thoughts, is exactly how God sees you and me. And Father, I know we all need your loving kindness and forgiveness. For we know that we are, without a doubt, affecting so many people. But above all, we're offending the God who's paid our sin debt in full. Let us remember what's the most important thing. And that is to serve the Lord with gladness and kindness that we may receive the same. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand and turn in your hymn books to page 156. <clears throat>
I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And when I say Amen, church must say Amen. Because you're going to be taking part in the faith that they need to grow. And only you can do that. I hope and pray you will. Want to have a song or something? Amber, you say? No.
Allie Vernon, your confession of Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life and your confession of sin, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, your turn, George. <laughs> if you stand up, please. And we'll dismiss. Father, thank you for this time of day. Thank you, Lord, for the souls that you've written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you, Father, for the this church and, and the inspiration the church has shown to, to the young people and to others that they may come to know Jesus Christ. Thank you for the grandparents and the family members that I know have rallied that, Lord, the greatest ones and the hardest ones to find and to bring to you is our own family members. The Lord, what a treat it is when they come young, when they come knowing that Jesus Christ is their Lord and they have a love for you that is greater than anything that we can ever comprehend. Now, Father, I ask you to bless all these that's come today. Bless the family members of these candidates that was baptized today. Bless them in a way, Lord, that they'll bring others of their family to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Thank you for this opportunity to serve you, Lord. And I pray it through Christ Jesus, His precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.